Hi, whether you're a first time YouTube guest or a long time member of our church, First Baptist Pulaski welcomes you. You know, our church family is messy. We are flawed. We have issues. We have sinned and fallen way short of what God desires and requires. But much of what motivates our worship is gratitude. See, God didn't leave us hopelessly wallowing around in the mud of our sin. No, He saw our need to be clean and sent His Son Jesus to take on human flesh, live the perfect life we could not, offer Himself on a cross as payment for our sins, and then rise victoriously from the dead. As Psalm 40 suggests, God lifted us up from the muck and mire, set our feet firmly on the rock of His Son, and put a new song of praise in our mouths. The truth is, we here at First Baptist Pulaski are imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. We hope the encounter you are about to have with Him puts a new song of praise in your mouth as well. And if you find yourself in our neck of the woods anytime soon, we would love to have you come worship, grow, and serve with us in person. Thank you so much for joining us. worship this morning comes from Psalm 111. It says this, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever. To be performed with faithfulness and uprightness, he sent rede redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. At this time, join me in prayer as we pray for our offering. Heavenly Father, we come before you so thankful for you and all that you have done. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is trustworthy, and Lord, that your promises even of salvation are kept. Lord, I thank you that my grandmother is with you today. Father, I pray that you be with us as we trust in what you have promised us. Lord, that we know for a fact that you are, in fact, faithful and worthy of our praise. Lord, even in this time of offering, as we give of what you have entrusted to us, Father, we trust you to do with it as you will, Lord, for your glory and for your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to serve in a church that loves our community and is reaching out, Father, as we lift up the work that is going on at CB, Lord, with the things that we have uh, that need to be approved through the state, Lord, with our charter, Lord, through the federal government, with our tax situation, Lord, Lord, for just the funding to be complete, Lord, and Lord, most importantly, Lord, that the work be done there that needs to be done so that more people can come to understand the faithfulness of you. Lord, your praise does endure forever. And Lord, even in this time of giving, that is how we worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The song Miss Beth was just playing for us started out, Wonderful, Merciful Savior. Indeed, He is. And there are those in our community and beyond who don't yet know Him, as Brother Aaron was praying about. And, you know, we just consider it a privilege to minister on His behalf. Thank you for those of you who uh, supported and prayed our little team back from Oaxaca. We got in late last night, just uh, back into Pulaski around midnight. So thank you for praying us back, and uh, we look forward to sharing with you a little bit more about what the Lord is doing in Oaxaca, and I hope you're encouraged by that. Uh, it's, it's an exciting time uh, to be ministering for the Lord, and, and in many ways, and again, we'll, we'll sort of 
be able to identify with this here as well. Sometimes we, you know, we, we don't really see the Lord working clearly. Uh, it doesn't seem like the Lord's doing much. Uh, and then all of a sudden, kind of sort of out of nowhere, things happen that blow our minds. We have conversations with people who we don't even realize the Lord is dealing with. And in an instant, their eternity changes forever. And, and so we, we just trust the Lord in, in this work here and beyond, and, uh, and we look forward to what he's going to do. When we gather at the rec center, maybe, or in our backyards around the 4th of July, with burgers in our bellies and fireworks sort of exploding overhead or whatever, wherever that setting is, we could be gathering to sort of enjoy or celebrate a lot of different things. It could be that we're gathering to kind of celebrate family. It could be that we're there to make memories. It could be um, that we're investing in our community somehow. And, and that, that warm fuzzy we get from being together around the 4th of July, is it's a good feeling for sure. Um, but what is the 4th of July really about? The 4th of July is really about our nation's independence. It's about, at a deeper level, freedom. And for us as Christians, we pause, I trust, to thank the Lord that in his grace, uh, he has allowed us to be here and to serve here and to minister in his name. For us to gather on mornings like this without persecution, um, we're a blessed people. So hopefully the 4th of July is about some of those things for us as well. Last week, last weekend, a three-day weekend, a long weekend, had a, we had a day off on Monday in our country for Labor Day. Labor Day could be a lot of things to a lot of people. It could be a time to do some labor, to mow the yard or wash the car or paint something that has not been painted or fix something that needs fixing or, or whatever. Um, it could be a time to go out and get a really good deal on a pair of jeans or a car or something like that or whatever it is we need to buy because I think it's the second busiest um, shopping day past or outside of Black Friday. Um, I think it's the second busiest shop, single shopping day on our American calendar anyway. So Labor Day could mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but you know, in the late 1800s, this tradition in our nation started to help sort of celebrate the contribution to our nation's prosperity that the worker makes, that the laborer makes in our nation. I'd, I'd be interested to know how many of us, I'll confess to you publicly that I did not. Uh, I did not pause to thank the Lord for the contributions of the laborers in our nation that have contributed to the prosperity of the United States. I did not do that Monday. And I'd be interested to know how many of us did. But we were enjoying a long weekend, I trust, we were out doing things, I trust, on a day that set aside for that remembrance. What does the, what does the 4th of July or Labor Day have to do with anything this morning? Well, in a way, it sort of has to do with everything this morning. Because we could be in this room together. We can gather on Sundays, and in just a few moments, we can pull this sheet back and have a celebration of the Lord's table. And it can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And we miss the whole point of why we're doing it, of why we gather on Sundays, of why we're partaking of the Lord's Supper, and of what it's really all about. And again, it's not that any of these things are in themselves bad, seeing friends or being encouraged or whatever. Uh, it's not that these things are bad. It's just they're not the main things. That's not, that's not the central reason why we gather. And to partake of the Lord's Supper, it, sometimes, it, it, again, there are some peripheral things we get caught up in and miss the main thing. So in, in the grace of God, in his, in his word today, he's going to help us kind of get oriented. We're headed toward 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is probably the central sort of teaching passage on the Lord's Table or the Lord's Supper, as we tend to call it in our circles, by the way, that's page 742. If, if the Bibles in the pew rack there are shorter than the hymnals, and it's page 1057, if they're the same height, 742 and 1057. So we're going to see, just, just for the sake of, of time today, we're going to see three big ideas about the Lord's Supper today, and we'll sort of 
shape them with the idea that the Lord's Supper is a time to something. So the Lord's Supper is a time to something. And we'll start in verse 26 uh, today. So again, the Lord's Supper, this remembrance meal is a time to, verse 26 says, as often as you drink or you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the first thing that the Lord's Supper is, is a time to proclaim the Lord's death. That sounds kind of morbid, um, but it, and it is, but it's not all at the same time. So, so the Lord's Supper is proclaiming Christ's death. And it's almost tempting for us as evangelical Christians to skip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to, to want to talk about the resurrection and all. So it's, it's a little bit interesting because his death doesn't mean ultimately uh, what we know it to mean until the resurrection happens because a lot of people have died. But no perfect people, apart from Jesus, there's never been one, has ever died for the sins of the world innocently and then shown to have that sacrifice be sufficient through the resurrection. No one's ever done that. No one ever will. He's the son of God who died to take away the sins of the world. And when he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, it shows us that the father accepted his sacrifice. But for the purposes of this morning and the purposes of our special remembrance, we're proclaiming the Lord's death. Now, this is not just the historical reality of the event that Jesus of Nazareth died. Outside of the Bible, historians talk about it. Josephus and others talk about this. We're not just talking about the historical reality. We're talking about proclaiming the special, singular nature of his sacrifice. That's what we're saying. We're proclaiming the, the, the singular, special nature of his sacrifice. And really, we're proclaiming this to one another by being here together. We're remembering together the special nature of his sacrifice. And we're also, in celebrating this publicly, we're proclaiming it to the world. So that's a pretty important reality. You might write down if you're a note taker, and there's a space on the back if you want to jot down a few extra scriptures. We won't turn there. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the word or the message, some, some of your translations will say, The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. It's foolishness to those in the world outside of Christ. They look at the death of Christ and they say, another guy who died. They look at the death of Christ and say, Christians with Jesus are just like Muslims with Muhammad or whatever. It's just another guy who died. The world looks at us and says, y'all are ridiculous. You're just making this up as you go along. You're just fixating on some escapist tendency or something. So the, the word or the message of the cross is foolishness to the world. Have you ever, do you have people at work or in your family look at you like you're a kook ball? Like you have lost your ever-loving mind for believing that Jesus of Nazareth is the son of God who died for our sins? I do. I have people like that in my life. They think, oh, you're a, you're a guy who's otherwise fairly intelligent and you choose to believe this? You know, it's, it's crazy that you would believe this. The message of the cross is foolishness to those in the world who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. The power of God is in the death of his son. To us who are being saved, the death of Christ is the power of God. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 1.23 says that the cross of Jesus is a stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles. We're telling the Jews he is your Messiah. He is the promised one. He is the anointed one. And they say, nah, nope. And again, back to the world, to the, to the Gentiles, to the nations, foolishness. So for us, the Lord's Supper is a time to proclaim the Lord's death. And notice at the end of verse 26 there, it says, until he comes. 
proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I, I, admittedly, I, almost just a second ago when I was talking about it, just a few moments, I, I paused because I was thinking, if the Lord tarries. I mean, I, I didn't want to be melodramatic about it, you know, and be super spiritual or, you know, all of that, be super Christian and have to get all the things in that need to be said, but they went through my mind. If the Lord tarries, I mean, do we live with a sense that before we even pull this sheet back, he could come back? Until he comes. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So again, it's not his return implies the ascension and his return as well. It's pretty, pretty cool. All right, the second thing that the Lord's Supper is, is a time to ponder our worthiness. Look at verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. So an unworthy manner, a time to ponder our worthiness is kind of the idea. There are some of us, um, and I will suggest that maybe this number is fewer than the number I'll get to in a second, but there are some of us who really sort of take ourselves too seriously when it comes to sin. We have such a low sense of self-worth and such a high feeling of our own inadequacy and our, and our, our own um, just deplorableness, if you will, I don't know, it's probably not even a word, before the Lord. We, we have such a low opinion of ourselves that we check up before we participate in the Lord's Supper. How could he love me? How, how could he accept me? How could he be okay with me? And when we read a verse, I'm going to say when you read a verse, because this is not where I live, okay? Um, I, I'm, I'm just not that humble that I could say that's where I live. Um, that who who drinks in an unworthy way. If you're taking it this way, you take yourself so seriously, you think, I'm not worthy of taking it because of the sin in my life or whatever. Um, you're missing the point. This is not about us being worthy. The truth of it is, it's about us being unworthy. We're, we're not worthy. None of us are worthy to participate in the life and in the eternal promise as, as Brother Aaron read from uh, Psalm 111, the covenant of God forever. None of us are worthy of that. So if, if we hold these elements and the, the, the plates coming and, the, and, the, you know, and we're, we're thinking about taking a piece of bread or pulling that cup out and we think about, Lord, I'm not worthy, I, I shouldn't even take it. If, if, if that was a qualifier that we be worthy to take it, all of us would just have to pass it and the trays would be full all the way to the back. None of us are worthy of taking anything, of participating in the promises of God. None of us are worthy. We're remembering his worthiness, his singular worthiness that we get to participate in. That's the point. But some of us maybe take ourselves too seriously, stop, and realize we're all rowing in that same boat together. We're all unworthy. That's the point. We're magnifying his name by participating. We're declaring we are unworthy and you alone are worthy. Do not let your sense of unworthiness keep you from participating. He is telling you through his incarnation, his life, his death, his resurrection, I love you. And in me, you are worthy. You are welcome. You are wanted. You are mine. Participate. So some, maybe some of us take ourselves too seriously. Some of us might not take the Lord seriously enough. And that's really what <clears throat> is kind of <clears throat> being stressed in this passage. Um, you know, in many ways, the Lord's Supper, we, we say in, in our Christian circles here that there are two ordinances of the church. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is a public declaration of, of our faith and what the Lord has done in our lives and in our hearts, uh, our reality. So it's a participation like, you know, baptism and the Lord's Supper are similar in that they're both a declaration and, a, and, and telling the world what we believe, proclaiming the death of Christ and all that. But 
Sometimes we don't take the Lord seriously enough, and what I mean by that is some of us know that we don't believe in the Son of God who died for our sins and rose from the dead. And we take those elements anyway. Don't. Don't. Don't take them. What the, what the Lord is, is driving home, again, we are unworthy. We are unworthy, but he is worthy. Not unworthy to take it as a Christian. Again, I'm going back to that. Try, let's liberate ourselves from that, those of us who are struggling with that idea. But what we're saying by taking these elements is, this is what I believe. This is my identity, that Christ died for my sin and rose from the dead. I am proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. This is my reality. And, and he says, don't take this in an unworthy manner. I'm thinking of um, the second commandment, don't take the Lord's name in vain, right? Don't, don't do it without, don't use it without purpose. Don't enter into this time of worship without the purpose of proclaiming his worth of proclaiming Jesus' reality. Don't do it. Don't take it in an unworthy manner or a manner that is not with purpose or intention in this way. But it could be also there are those of us who have trusted Christ. And we know that our lifestyles don't line up with what God says we should be doing. With our time, with our money, with our mouth, with our participation in the church, with us sharing the good news with someone in our life who's lost or um, and, and more specifically, body life, I'll get to that in a second, how we're treating one another in his church. Because that's in the co immediate context of 1 Corinthians, that's what it's talking about. So the idea here in general is, those of us who have named his name, if we have known sin in our lives, we're being called to repentance. We're being called to a place of being restored to right fellowship and effectiveness for the Lord. So do we take the sacrifice of our Lord too lightly, that he suffered and bled and died innocently, that he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and we're just going to wink at that and keep sinning, and wink at that and keep sinning, and wink at that and do our thing, and raise our hand and shake our fist and live our life without much regard for the high price he paid for us. We have been bought with a price, and we are his. He has ulti the ultimate right as our creator, first of all, to, to dictate what we do. But as our Redeemer and our friend, we owe it to Him to celebrate His worth through our worship and our obedience. And if we partake of the cup and, and we eat the bread and we just say, thanks, and I'm going to go out of this room and I'm just going to do my thing, we're partaking in an unworthy manner. We need to be sober-minded, again, not like melancholy, home, 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 it's the Lord's Supper, home. It's not like that. It's not heavy and dark and all that, but it is, it is sobering. You know, it, it, is, it is a time to check us, check ourselves. In context here, one of the biggest indicators of us taking the Lord seriously is that we're actively loving the church, that we're actively loving each other. I'm not talking about teaching Sunday school necessarily or singing in this choir, thank you all. I'm not talking about singing or serving necessarily. I'm talking about how we treat one another. Are we esteeming each other or tearing each other down? You know, are we, are we investing in each other and building each other up or are we gossiping about each other? and lying about each other, you know, and showing favoritism or whatever else it is. Another reference you might write on the back of your bulletin, Jude chapter 12, and some extra biblical writings tell us that the early church was, was in the practice of having a meal before the meal. They would have a fellowship meal, um, a, a love feast it's called in Jude, I think, uh, an agape meal, that, that was the word that was used. So sort of a celebration of our, of our family. We might call it a potluck if scripture had been written in the you know, 21st century or whatever. So there would be a potluck where everybody would eat and then they would have a time at the Lord's table, a time of remembrance. And 
some places in the, in the first century church, like here in Corinth, the church was getting together for this love feast meal, and they were not treating each other well. They were not esteeming each other. Look at verse 20. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For at the meal, each one eats his own supper ahead of the others. So one person's hungry while another person gets drunk. So they're, they're gathering and, and working you know, through this main meal, leading toward the Lord's Supper meal probably, and some are overeating and some are getting drunk. Verse 22, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you look down on the church of God and embarrass those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I do not praise you for this. You're not being considerate of one another. Look down in, in verses uh, 33 and 34. Therefore, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you get together, you will not come under judgment, meaning you will not disregard each other and leave someone out. I will give instructions about the other matters whenever I come, Paul says. So this... This Lord's Supper, back in the early days, probably had unleavened bread that got broken off in pieces. Some people still use what we call the common loaf, and you'll tear off a piece as it's going by now. Germaphobes here would not be happy for us to do that. It's an act of faith for them to touch a cracker that someone else might have touched when they got their cracker, right? So if we had a common loaf where we took that piece off, or a common cup where everybody filed through up front and the pastors kind of wiped the rim and everybody drank after each other, that probably wouldn't go over too well here in Southern Baptist circles, would it? No, the, the, that whole thing. Or the best yet, the whole tincture thing, they do them both at the same time. They pinch them off and dip them in and then give it to you. That'd be fun. Um, so we don't want any of that happening. But the symbolism of the Lord's Supper it would not be lost on the first century church, especially because they would probably have tended to tear the bread apart. Okay, so when we see, when, and we'll think about this more in a second, this is my body given for you. Yes, that is the Lord's physical body. Okay, we, we get that. But where does the Lord, in, in a spiritual sense, reside today? In the church. We are his body. So there's some sense that if we're disregarding the body, it's taking lightly the sacrifice of Christ. But in this context, it's also taking lightly our responsibility to each other. That, 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 we're, that we're disregarding one another. And again, we're not perfect. We don't need to walk around beating ourselves up that's that's not it but we need to be we need to be called to an account you know we need to answer the prompting of the holy spirit that each of us is feeling at this at this time we need to deal with it if we're not building up the body and we're tearing it down we need to deal with it because we are the body of christ alongside the, the global body, of course. But here in our local context, when we ponder worthiness, the worthiness of Christ, if he died for all of humanity, if he loves the church, if we are his bride, don't you think it's our responsibility to love each other? <laughs> it is. It is, even, you know, warts and all, even when it's difficult. So, a time to ponder our worthiness, his worthiness, our unworthiness, however you want to look at that. And lastly, a time to examine ourselves, as I trust the, the Lord has been pressing into our hearts already. Verse 28, so a man should examine himself, and in this way he should eat the bread and drink from the cup. It's a time to examine ourselves. We just don't do that very well. We don't pause and get honest with ourselves. We, we are so busy a lot of times that we don't think deep thoughts. We don't, we don't really get still and like 
meditate on a word or a phrase or a verse or a paragraph or a chapter in the Bible and just say, Lord, just drill my heart with this. You know, we, we have a verse of the day on our phones and it pops up as a notification and we glance at it and we just kind of skim it, swipe left, it's gone, we're moving on. That's our day kind of thing. But do we really pause to examine ourselves to let, to let the Holy Spirit press that word into our hearts and etch something in there that we need to respond to. I, again, I don't every day. I don't. But look at verse 29. Whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, and again, there's a double entendre here. It's Christ's body in, in faith, and it's also the value of the redeemed, the body of Christ, Whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's, that's pretty, pretty stout. Because those of us who have not yet placed our faith in Christ and we eat and we drink, we're saying we have trusted Christ for the forgiveness of our sins when we haven't. There is eternal judgment for that. If we do not profess, if we do not believe in Christ, if we do not proclaim, you know, publicly what we believe privately in our hearts, if that's not what this is about, there's eternal judgment for that. And by the way, in the grace of God over the next month and a half or so, we're going to spend some time talking about the realities of heaven and hell and kind of dig into that subject. So if you would, you know, please be in prayer for that as we get ready and also invite some people. Uh, to discover that with us. But for those of us who are taking the death of the Lord lightly, ignoring known sin, especially within the church in this context or whatever, it leads to a loss of rewards. Not, not a loss of salvation, but a loss of rewards in heaven. And can invite the Lord's discipline before we even get there. Look in verse 30. This is why many are sick and ill among you. Those, those who are in the church are taking the Lord lightly and not dealing with sin, this is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. I can tell you as a guy dealing with cancer, I read a verse like this, that gets my attention. Um, and by the way, I haven't heard from doctors. I'll let the church know when I hear something. But, you know, there are a lot of us in the church family who are dealing with a lot of stuff. A lot of people in the church dealing with a lot of stuff, a lot of pain, a lot of heaviness. And by the way, sometimes we as staff, I, we know you're interested but it's, but it's almost unfair, the exposure that we get to some of our mess because we're up front. But, but we're trying to, you know, share the load together with everybody's heaviness, too. So um, sometimes that's why we're not wanting to chat about all that. But at, at the end of the day, again, I'll let you know uh, what's going on. But it says, you know, many are sick and are ill and have fallen asleep. Um, so maybe... I mean, I had to pause in preparation for this morning and say, Lord, is it, what in my life am I maybe being disciplined for through what I'm going through that you need to let me know about? I mean, one thing that dealing with, um, you know, a potentially terminal illness is, you know, your pride, your humanity, in, in your own humanity and strength that says, I can do this without your help, Lord. I can live life and do things and, you know, whatever else. And I said, nope. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't take a day for granted. So, you know, at least for me, that was one of the things the Lord said. But let's also not forget those of us who are sick or whatever, John chapter 9. That might be another verse, you, a passage you want to write down. Where the disciples asked Jesus about this man born blind. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be in this condition? And, and Jesus said, this happened so the works of God, the wonders of God, the glory of God might be on display. And he spits on, you know, Get, picks up some dirt and spits in it and puts it on the guy's eyes and he sees. So the point is, this guy was not, he was not dealing with physical illness because of anything he or his parents or anybody else had done wrong. It was so the glory of God might be displayed. And I hope in, in your issues and perhaps mine, that will be God's choice for us, is that he would put his glory on display through healing. But if not, he would put his glory on display through our faith during the difficulty. I don't know. The general principle here in this little passage where we are, God is holy and cannot abide our sin. Whether it's unto eternity or in our practical terms as his children. Verses 31 and 32. 
drive this home and then we'll be finished. If we were properly evaluating ourselves, we would not be judged. In other words, if we've come to him in faith, we will escape judgment. Or for those of us who are in the family of God, if we're rightly evaluating ourselves and returning to be restored to full fellowship, we're not going to come under any kind of temporal or eternal judgment. But verse 32, but when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned with the world. So now we approach the Lord's table needing to examine ourselves and see where we are with all of this. So we've seen a time to declare our faith by proclaiming the Lord's death. We've seen a time to ponder our worthiness, that we are not, but he is, of our all, and to examine ourselves. Miss Beth's going to start playing, and we're going to have a time of just quiet reflection and move into a time of uh, the Lord's Supper. So it... If you feel compelled to come to the altar and pray, the altar will be open. Some of the pastors will be here to pray with you if you want. Um, if not, just pray where you are. Let's, let's take a minute or two and just uh, be still before the Lord, be contemplative, be honest, and uh, let the Holy Spirit lead as we approach the Lord's table. Father, we thank you for this time of reflection. Help us by your Spirit not to run away or wiggle away or to be in denial. Lord, help us do the hard work of being honest, of examining ourselves, the light of your word and what you've shown us today, and respond to you. We give you this time of reflection and invitation. Father God, as we come to this time in our service, Lord, to have this communion lord we just ask that we have examined ourselves lord and we just thank you for the ultimate sacrifice of sending your son here to suffer and die for us lord and we just uh, celebrate this time even though we're humble and we're not worthy lord that through you we are worthy and that we have the chance to redeem and to be have a chance to be in heaven with you lord just thank you again for this ultimate sacrifice in christ's name we pray amen we're going to join together and sing In Remembrance, hymn number 405.
received from the Lord what was passed on to you on the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Precious living Heavenly Father, we know that we're not worthy to partake of this Lord's Supper, but we know you are worthy, and Lord, because you're worthy, you can make us worthy. And we know that you loved us so much that you willingly came to this world, and you shed your precious blood for us, and we know without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sins. Thank you for your love for us, Father. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Well, we hope that his grace and his love flowing down is something that resonates with your heart and your soul, that that's your reality. In just a second, after we observe the taking of the cup, we're going to stand and sing a couple of songs that celebrate uh, the Lord and the life that we have in him. And we hope those worship songs also connect with your heart, that you're able to enter into that as an expression of, of your walk with the living God because he loves you deeply, eternally he loves you and we together today have been celebrating his love a love that was willing to become flesh and humble himself to the point of death on a cross before he got there Jesus said in the same way after he took the cup, he said, This is the new covenant established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. You may stand, please, for a time of worship.
Lord, we thank you that you're mighty to save. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die in our place. Lord, so unworthy we are, but God, you sent him for us. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in this place this morning. Let's leave here changed, Lord, to do what you've called us to do. Be your disciples, Lord, and share, Lord, the love of Jesus Christ with all those around us each and every day. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.